We are back on the Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T with our final wrap-up of the season. And I'm Derek Rackley. with DJ Shockley and Dave Archer, as always. Here's a quick, quick rundown of what we're going to cover. Finishing the season with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, we will look forward after that victory to, victory to close out the season. Yes, Dean P's retirement. We'll talk a little bit about his legacy in turn to president, there were some promotions going around the Atlanta mm. Falcons organization this past week. We'll talk a little, about, a little bit about Greg Beatles being named as the new Atlanta Falcons president. And then, of course, Terry Fontenot, Arthur Smith, their end of season press conference. We'll recap what the guys heard there and then look ahead to the next stage of turning it into the 2023 season, which will be free agency and the draft. But before we get started, we have a former dog hey on now. this podcast. Hey, now. And if anybody was playing, paying attention to some college football this past week, um, I don't know if we could say they saw a game. They saw <laughs> something that was attempted to be played in front of a national audience, but that turned out to be a wipeout. Yeah. DJ, congratulations to you and your dogs on back-to-back national championships. And is there any other way to say about a dominating performance than what we saw on Monday night? Well, I wish I say, wish I could say I had something to do with it, but uh... – <laughs> No, it was fun, though, man. I tell you, it's just fun when um, my counterpart to the left is a part of the Big 12 when we get to, you know, rub it into the Big 12 over here. Yeah, we'll get there in a second. Oh, okay, my bad. I was a little early. but No, man, it was uh, it was fun, man. L.A. was cool. Obviously, it was raining like crazy, but uh, it was a downpour for the dogs in there. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, it was – Nothing like what we saw the previous week where I was nervous and stressed and wasn't even playing, playing against Ohio State. And this week it was, wasn't even a, a threat of anything happening for or against the dogs. So it was fun, though, man. I'm proud of those dudes, man. Uh, Kirby continues to, uh, you know, elevate the program, which you love as a former player and alumni of the university. So back-to-back natties is, is pretty remarkable. And I think we all know how special it is and how hard it is to win. Uh, on that level, and for them to go out and do it, I was uh, super hyped for Yeah, we talked a little bit via text, us three, and uh, I don't have any personal connections to the program, but Arch, as, as residents of the state of Georgia, sometimes you you kind of have to take a little bit of interest in, in the home team and how they have gotten themselves, I mean, you want to say to the pinnacle. I mean, they're on the very top of the mountain, the things that they've been able to do. DJ kind of talked a little bit about it you cover a lot of the big 12 and I'm sure from that perspective you were maybe a little surprised that it was not as much of a fight from TCU's side but again as I mentioned you live in the state of Georgia so it's hard not to be amazed and impressed by what Kirby Smart has done yeah no question about it I got a lot of respect for Kirby gotten to know him over the years we played in golf tournaments together things of that nature great dude um, a guy that's a, that played for the dog. I mean, you couldn't have a bigger legacy guy running the program than a dude to play DB for him, and then is now directing traffic for him. But they were, they were, they were. When you get a situation where you get the best team and they play one of their better games, if not their best game, it doesn't matter who the opponent is. They're going to run you off the field, and that was the case here. And I don't. The, the discussion going around around the country. I know we want to get the Falcon stuff here. But the discussion going on around the country is about the SEC versus the Big 12 and the in the in the Big 10. Uh, uh-uh. the discussion is about Georgia and Alabama versus everybody else. <laughs> That's what the discussion is. Yeah, yeah. And until you get your mind right on that, because I guarantee you, Ole Miss, Kentucky, Vanderbilt, they're going. How do we beat those guys? They don't know how to beat those guys. Right. Let alone TCU or Ohio State or whoever lost to Georgia this year. So. Make let's let's not get this thing twisted. It's a Georgia and an Alabama problem for everybody else in the country, <laughs> yes. not just for TCU. Uh, and the one thing I do know, and we talked a little bit about this, is and this is any level because we're going to get to the NFL here. Is yes, you want to have great coaches. We know that there's great coaches at Georgia and Alabama and all over the country, but you got to have dudes. Dudes. Ooh. And Georgia's got some dudes. Got some and dudes. all them dudes are coming back. <laughs> See you That's next year, baby. <laughs> and maybe some of them dudes are going to be playing in the NFL this next year. So let's get to that. And, and for the Atlanta Falcons, it wasn't quite a 65-7 to victory, but no, it was a 30-17 to <laughs> victory over a division rival in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to close out the season in a 7-10 and year for the Atlanta Falcons. So we're not going to dive necessarily into the X's and O's of that game. Let's talk a little bit more about how that game 
that victory kind of springboards this team as we move forward. Arch, again, as the analyst of the team, you get to see them in probably one of the more intimate ways, dissecting X's and O's each week, calling it on the radio. From what you saw against the Buccaneers, how do you feel like this kind of parlays them moving into the offseason? Well, I mean, you can't help but be really excited. I, I've Over the last couple of weeks, I've left games, even though we lost prior to the two games coming to home, we beat Arizona and Tampa, even in Baltimore. I left that game with a smile on my face thinking about the young players on this team. And that is an even more accentuated at the end of the season with the progress you saw Desmond Ritter make at the quarterback position. Uh, the running back is a dude. You talk about Ooh, a dude now. Man. I mean, Tyler Algier, that's a fifth-round draft pick. I mean, when we gonna start talking about uh, the scouting department and what Crush Terry it. Fontenot's group did to get a dude like that in the fifth round, <laughs> he's he's arguably the best back in the league right now. I mean, <laughs> you, you could make that argument. The dude had a great year, broke yep. the all-time record for a rookie. And let's, let's qualify it, too, is – he played 16 games this year. He was not elo. He was not uh, active in game one. Yeah. So don't tell me about his 1,035 yards being in 17 games. Uh-uh. He played 16 games. He broke William Andrews' record from 1979 uh, as the all-time leading rusher in Falcon history as a rookie with 1,035 yards. William Andrews checked in at 1,023, and Will was a great player. If this guy is anywhere near as good as William Andrews is, you got something. I think you're going that direction. Drake London – Broke, I mean, records too. broke the rookie record for receptions <laughs> in a season that was set by Kyle Pitts the year before. Oh, by the way, that dude's coming back <laughs> next year. I mean, that's that's where it is with me, Rack, and we could go through all the young dudes, and it's not just the first-year guys, the rookies. It's, J it's Richie Grant and the strides he made. It's Jalen Hawkins, who's a year older than that, third year. A.J. Terrell. This is a young football team. I think it's one of the three or four youngest teams in the league returning that's where my optimism is and the way they close the show, the way they've never quit playing, the way they bought into what Arthur's selling, uh, and it's a legitimate uh, thing here. They've got something going on here. Now with all that money shock, now all of a sudden if, if I'm a free agent yeah. and I see that young group down there that are dogs that are playing mm -hmm. hard, yeah, I'm going to go play with them guys. Yeah, so that's – you know, we're going to get into a little bit of the personnel side of this a little later when we talk about the head coach and general manager's press conference. But you're right, Arch, and, and DJ, I turn to you because if, if you're looking at promising pieces to the puzzle moving forward, yes, you generally look at guys that came from the draft. And not just this game against the Buccaneers, but even going back the last few weeks, I mean, Ritter, Algier, and London Later showed away. that they can end up being – pillars of this franchise and they did some really special things their rookie year they're only going to get better between this year and next year We're talking about the game completely slowing down for those guys later in the part of the year was something that you you look at and you marvel at and I think Archie did such a great job of breaking down what those guys did and exactly how uh, successful they were towards the end of the year and it makes you wonder like okay these guys they got it. They understood it. And we point to the rookies, but I also point to some of those veteran guys. You're talking about a guy like Rashawn Evans comes in his first year and absolutely by his play led by example and probably brought a lot of the young guys along. Lorenzo Carter, another guy on those one-year deal who came in here and throughout the entire season, you could tell he gave everything he had. He fought hard. He was a guy who, you know, constantly put pressure on the quarterback. So having the nucleus of, yeah, we got some young guys, but then we also had some veteran guys who come in here and show exactly what they're about. And I love the part about you offensively established your identity. And I think regardless of who you played, what defense you were playing against, I remember playing against, we were playing against the 49ers, and everybody said there's no way you can do what you do versus that kind of defense, and it didn't matter. So the fact that – like Arch mentioned, you're going to have guys who are going to look at this team and say it didn't matter who they played, especially on the offensive side of the ball, they have a distinct identity of who they are and what they're going to do. Every single ball game, you saw the physicality in the run game. You saw a back get downhill. You saw quarterbacks making the right decisions in the run game. And then you saw receivers on the outside blocking their, their tails off. This is an offense that has an identity that has established what the culture is. And that's what everybody talks about sometimes – 
And, you know, when you have an organization, what's your culture? What's your identity? I think offensively you know exactly who it is. I know we're going to talk – Dean Pease and the defense here in a second, but I think you saw it on both sides of the ball. And that's something that gives you some optimism going forward is you can look at this squad and know exactly what they are about. You know exactly who the head coach is. You know exactly what the GM wants to do. There's no confusion about where they're heading and the type of players they want. So I thought you end this season the right way with two wins at home and you go into the offseason on exactly where – the, the the holes that you want to kind of close up, you feel good about. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on the Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. You know, guys, I, I want to uh, highlight something because I just sat here and I was kind of thinking through some things all the way back to last year. I remember we were sitting here doing a very similar podcast, kind of capping the season, and you guys know me in one of the areas, I'm old school, one of the areas I felt like Atlanta needed to grow was on the offensive line. And I started to think back to all the podcasts that we've done this year. How critical have I been of the offensive line this year? Yeah. Not so much, yeah. right? And I think, number one, it's a testament to them growing as a unit. Number two, it's a testament to two things. Having a quarterback that can help kind of get away from some of the pressure, but then also finding a running game, and those guys get excited about it. <laughs> I mean, you heard it all year. Guys like Lindstrom Turner are saying, you know, this rookie, like, he runs hard. Yeah. It makes the offensive line almost work harder. Focus on their game a little bit more because they know they got a couple of dudes, and Algier, Algier and CP behind them, that are going to go run some, run over somebody. It's funny you say that because I heard uh, Lindstrom say last week he knew exactly where Algier was. He knew he had 900 yards. He knew that he wanted to get him to 1,000 because that spoke monuments about what they were able to do. Yes. So – you're talking about having pride in the run game. They absolutely did. They knew exactly where their back was, this young guy trying to break 1,000 yards. And that speaks volumes that you say, hey, I blocked for a 1,000-yard back. That's something that, you know, a lot of guys take pride in, especially when you play up front and play offensive line. And we know Arthur Smith has that background up front with that offensive line. So having the pride and the value to say, hey, we're going to go and – force the issue in the run game it was fun to watch this year yeah growth of, from the offensive line found some young players that that really are are showing some excitement and growth for years to come um and then you know obviously there's going to be some changes year to year and dj you kind of uh it led me into it and let's talk a little bit about dean pease obviously uh announcing his retirement a guy that has been so co accomplished in and i would just say the game of football because he started at high school Transitioned into small college, worked his way up through mid-majors, and then got his chance in the bigger time at Notre Dame, Michigan State, then makes the transition over into the NFL, has a very fruitful career in the NFL with a number of different teams, and he's going to end his career here with the Atlanta Falcons. Dave, I'm going to come back to you and just say what Dean Pease has meant to this team and to this defense and the growth that you've seen from some of the players on that side of the ball. Well, I think, first of all, the – the, the dogged way they play. They play, you know, every, the entire game. We saw times when the, when teams in the past, you know, you got into a situation where you kind of felt like, okay, well, they're they're going to kind of succumb to what's going on. This team never was like that. I I thought that a couple of moments in games, uh, the red zone stuff that they did was pretty good. Um, you could argue, hey, third down, we weren't very good on third down. That's true. Um, and you weren't you weren't great at stopping the run game when TQ once TQ Graham got hurt. I thought that the rotation became thinner in the defensive line. I think Graham is a guy. By the way, you talk about another guy coming back off of injury. It's mm -hmm. a part of the young group of this team. That guy's going to be a, a a pretty good player. And you add maybe some other players to him, and we'll talk about that. But um, I thought that that well, that was a big injury for for Atlanta to overcome. Yet Dean continued to mix and match. There at times he'd have five linebackers on the field. 
you'd have, you know, you had the two edge guys are linebackers, three inside guys are linebackers. So he mixed and matched. How many injuries do we have? And, and we know we don't like to use this as an excuse, but we can look at it as that. Think about how many different guys you had playing corner opposite A.J. Terrell. Even when A.J. went down, A.J. was down for a game or two where the secondary was banged up. I thought that the guy really did a good job of kind of putting puzzle pieces together. And let's not make – let's not get it screwed up here when you start thinking about how many points this team give up during games. Mm. You were in you were in 13 one-score games this year. Now, we didn't we, – we were 5-8 and eight in those games. But you were in the game to win it, yep. and it's because you were able to keep people off of the scoreboard. Okay? And let's not forget also – that when you're a staff, and you guys know this, you don't just stay on one side of the bill. Okay, the defense, those are your four rooms. Don't come out of those rooms. Those are your rooms. Here's the <laughs> offensive rooms. The reason Dean Pease was hired here was because Arthur knew him and trusted him and had tremendous respect for him as a defensive coordinator. Lured him out of retirement to come here. Okay, he didn't just bring him here to coach the defense. He came here to talk to him about how do I attack a defense. They, they had conversations about our offense and how you attack defense. And this is what this defense is doing. What do you see, Dean, here that might be – those conversations happened. So to think that he was just exclusively in the defensive coordinator office, that's what you're losing when you have a guy like that step away. He'll be a big shoes to fill. Now, I think there will be some guys you could go, and you can get better defensively because of the bricks that are laid here as a foundation. But the guy meant a lot to this team, and and he'll uh, he he had a great career, um, and God bless him, man. Hope he has a great retirement. He and his wife deserve it. He's yeah. he's worked his rear end off this league, and and to to kind of add to Arch, what you just mentioned, uh, absolutely uh, wish Coach P is the best. Obviously, fifty years in the game, doing it at the level that he did it, he absolutely deserves this retirement. And the fact that, like you mentioned, Arthur Smith, when he got him out of retirement, because he knew what this guy's about, and I think that's one of the things that that is so important and why he has so much respect is because of the things that he does in game. But you got so many guys and coaches in his league that are so smart, but you look at a guy like Dean Pease and people respect the heck out of him because of what he's done over time. And I think one of the biggest things that, you know, he did the best job of this year and Arch kind of alluded to it was being able to put those pieces together, but getting the most out of the personnel that he had. Because a lot of people came into this year, we had, you know, we mentioned a lot of one-year guys, a lot of, you know, guys who are trying to find themselves, a lot of young guys. And DMP did such a good job of changing the look of what this defense was every single week. And I think that was, was fun for me to watch when you turn on the tape that every week a lot of stuff looked different. There were some, some games early in the year where – you could see exactly what the Falcons' defense were doing. And then by the middle of the year, you could see the disguises were a little bit better. You were bringing blitzes from different areas. You were trying to, trying to you know, conform this defense to fit the right way. And I think they did a, such a good job of getting these guys to play at such a higher level and the schemes he drew up. He is just one of those guys that, you know, you, you hate turning on the tape and watching because you're going to get so many different things from him. And I thought he did such a great job of finding ways to – to bring the most out of, you know, a lot of guys who a lot of people probably written off. And Coach Pease is one that I remember going against him when I was playing. And you looked at his defense and sometimes you just shook your head like, he just got us on this one. And he did a lot of that throughout his time. So I wish him well in retirement as well. Um, I was glad we, we had the opportunity to have him here for a couple of years. I'm sure a lot of those guys on the defense side of the ball learned so much from what he has brought – to the game of, of football and to the NFL, and those guys will be better down the road because they were coached by Dean Pease. Yeah, well said, DJ. And on behalf of all of us here at the Falcons Audible, we wish, wish Coach Pease the best in retirement. He has earned every little bit of all of the basking in the sun that hopefully <laughs> he is going to do and uh, spending time with those closest to him. So you guys kind of alluded to it here. Um, not only are there personnel holes to fill, but there's also a defensive coordinator position to fill, which kind of leads us to the end of the season press conference that happened between Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot. And one of the highlights of that press conference arch was Arthur Smith saying that he knows the type of person that he's looking for. And now with some of the adjustments that they've made in hiring, he's got a little bit more time to take his time, right? And not feel like he has to rush into a hire, but he knows 
what he's looking for because he knows as a play caller what is difficult for him to go up against. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you think about some of the most important moves this offseason might be personnel. Well, it's also going to be in the coaching ranks is who Arthur ends up hiring as a D coordinator. Yeah, I think that the thing that he and Terry have done, Terry Fontenot, the GM here, have done is they haven't hamstrung themselves by building it to a certain model. They've got a lot of versatile players. You saw it when Shock and I were talking about with the versatility that Dean showed within the different looks, the different personnel groups they had defensively. Um, so that gives them a lot of versatility as to what they want to go. I think that a lot of fan gets caught up in the, the adage 4-3-3-4 four, three, three, four, you know, most teams aren't really either one anymore. It's hybrid style defenses where you can morph in and out of three man line, four man line. 65 to 66 percent of the game is played at a nickel set, which is usually a four down line. You see some teams rush three and drop eight. You see teams rush three and, and bring three or four from the second level. Those are all things that this team is built to do. And now you're going to get ready to add maybe another level of talent. That's good because of money, you're going to be able to spend both free agency and your draft that's going to come up in April. And now all of a sudden, some of the versatility that you have on the team already blended with some of the new players exponentially makes you better the next year. So I think the thing that I'm encouraged about the most is the versatility that this team has from a personnel standpoint defensively, what they could potentially add to it. And, and, and the, you've got a head coach, as you just talked about, Rack, that has an idea of what that is supposed to look like and there's a number of guys out there, you know. There's some there's some veteran coaches that are analysts on other job, other places that have been GM, have been defensive coordinators. There's young up and coming guys that are linebacker coaches or that maybe have been in the Dean P system, if you will, or, or or some have some knowledge of that. So I think there's a lot of encouraging stuff. They're they're going to scour this thing. This is not going to be a quick, easy choice for them. Yep. They're going to make sure they do their homework on this one. Yeah, they, they talked, Arch, a lot about replacing Dean Pease. They also discussed, DJ, um, this is kind of the next phase in their plan. And I thought mm. this was interesting because – I start. I try to pull myself out, and I'm, I'm sure you guys do as well. I try to pull myself out of a guy that's been in locker rooms and, and understands how the inner workings of the NFL works, and I start to try to think about it as a fan, people that are listening to us right now. Because your Falcons fan might say, we've got to have this guy if we're going to take the next step in our development. we got to go find the best pass rusher, and we got to pay him whatever he's worth, right? Well, we all know that that's not always the easiest thing to do. Right. First of all, they didn't have the money to do that before. Right. Second of all, if that guy, you pay him all that money and he doesn't produce like you want him to, you're right back to square one. Or maybe he does produce Arch, but this guy is bad in the locker room and he messes up the chemistry. Right. So they've always got to try to find the right fit. So, DJ, they talked about the next plan, the next phase of our plan. Right. Which they had to make some tough decisions. They had to decide to move on from guys like Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, recently reworking Jake Matthews' contract because they had to get in a better position with the cap. And now they are. You guys have both talked about it. So it's such an important offseason because now they can be players in free agency. But that doesn't mean you go free will and spend. It still has to be the right piece to the Atlanta Falcons puzzle. And it's it's great the way you put that because they were thoughtful – and you could tell they had a clear and precise plan of what they want the future to look like, like you just mentioned. And there were a couple of quotes that I took out of it that speaks directly to it. And Art, you mentioned earlier when they said, hey, we're going to have some cash. But they also said, you know, even though we'll have the cash to go out and spend, we still want to be disciplined on their decisions. Don't want to go back to the point where they were when they first mm-hmm. arrived here in Atlanta. <clears throat> and that tells you they're purposefully thinking about how can they make this team better, but also put it in a position where it can continuously be better going in the future? Talk about the defensive coordinator. They said they're going to be purposeful and open-minded finding a new D.C., but they will not start from scratch. And I thought that was big, too, because we talked about already the pieces that that's already here. Find a guy who can come in and also bring in something different, but also know, okay, here's what your personnel is going to look like for the future. You know, obviously you're going to bring in new guys, have different parts of it. But I thought that part was big, too. And he said when he, when we sign and draft players, Terry said this, we won't be prisoners of the moment. And I think that speaks to the point where you just talked about, of, okay, maybe this guy did this this year. 
but you look back two years ago and he had, you know, less sacks or he had whatever issue was. And the other part was you're talking about having character guys that come here that can fit the culture that you want. You don't want to just bring guys in. Yeah, he may have 15 sacks, but he may not be good in your locker room. And I think that's a big deal as well. And you saw that this year. We talked about it earlier with some of the veterans that they brought in. They fit this culture automatically. They came in knowing exactly – what kind of guys they were. And I think all that kind of stuff goes together to men, what they want to do going into the offseason. So I think they absolutely have a plan going forward for who they want for as a D.C. They have a plan going forward with the type of players that they want to bring in on both sides of the ball, and they're going to be calculated about it, which is great because it, you know exactly they have a plan for it, and that's something that you, as a fan, can be excited and say, all right, these guys know exactly what they're doing. And, Art, you mentioned it earlier. Give a lot of credit to the scouting staff. Talking about the guys that you bring in or the guys that you go draft, these are guys that you got to know that's going to come in and fit who Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot want right away. So I think that's a big enough deal in his own right that they also have those type of people on the outside. We talk about the personnel a lot. Yep, yep. We talk about the personnel on the field, the, the coaching personnel, but also the bigger picture is the staff part of it. Those guys have to know exactly what is your vision and be able to bring you guys that say, all right, coach, I think they fit exactly what you're looking for. So uh, I think it's totally an organizational thing, but you got two guys at the top in Terry Fondo and Arthur Smith who absolutely have a plan all the way around of what they want this organization to look like. So maybe a little bit more unique than in years past. Atlanta potentially going to be some big-time players in free agency. But, guys, that's just one piece of it. We don't want to forget about the draft. And you think about this past year, we just talked about it. One, three, and five. The first, third, mm -hmm. and fifth round picks – nailed it out of the park this year and so and I don't want to take anything away from the other draft picks but those are the three that stick out that just really ended up we got the chance to see them we got a chance to see a body of work and the type of future players that they can be who's to say that they don't knock it out of the park with three four or five guys again yeah. this next year then you add Troy Anderson to that mix too I mean he you absolutely starts late in the absolutely year, well so yeah so not you mentioned the entire organization. The entire organization is going to be busy just because they're not in the postseason. They got plenty of things to do. You've got the bowl games coming up. You got the uh, East West Shrine game, which the Falcons coaching staff will be a part of. The Senior Bowl, they're going to be heavily there, and then obviously every other phase of this off season is a chance for them to find players and get better as an organization, as you mentioned. So kudos not just to Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith, but everybody involved in bringing personnel into this organization. Yeah, and I think that is we as fans, and we we cheer for the team too or whatever. We're, we've all played for the team. We all want the team to do well. The thing to maybe keep in mind too is that what you saw from whatever player this year, whether it's Arnold Ebikati or Tyler Algier, don't think that these guys can improve. Uh, I think that we get caught up in okay, that's the that's that's what we got there. So now let's go get these guys. Are, look at the look at the improvement Richie Grant made from his rookie year to his second year, and that's what they're expecting. That's what Terry Fontenot talked about in his press conference. Is we expect these guys to take where their game is now and take it to another level. So we're talking about adding other pieces. Another part of this thing that's going to make this team a better team are these guys that got to play early in their career, young guys that take that next step. In fact, they're going to be required to take that next step. So there's going to be an onus on the player this offseason to go ahead and get better. You know, I point to a guy, a former Georgia Bulldog, and, and Justin Schaefer, who's been on the practice squad all year long. Great big dude who can play guard. There's a need at left guard, potentially. It's there. Can, can you make that step? He's learned how to prepare as an NFL player. He's practiced all year long against NFL defensive linemen. He's learned the system. He understands what's going on from a pass protection standpoint. I expect him to be in the mix. That's just one guy to make that improvement, that next step. He got a red shirt year, if you will, as a, as a rookie uh, for the Falcons. Opportunity for him to get better. Those are just some things that you got to keep in mind. And they're also going to have to keep in mind, too, that there's some guys on this team that you'd like to keep that you're going to have to resign. It's not just about going outside the building. There's yep. some guys in the building that are going to need to be resigned. Maybe you get, maybe they get a better deal someplace else. That's the nature of the game. That's the nature of the business. So you have to adjust to that, too. It, it is a hard job now to be the GM, to be the head coach of a National Football League team with the ebb and flow that we see each and every year. Yeah, no doubt. And, <clears throat> and obviously it's a time when – Every NFL player, every coach that's not playing in the postseason wishes they were in the postseason. 
But I think if you're an organization like Atlanta, and, and again, that's all that Arthur and Terry are focused about are, are the Atlanta Falcons. But there's a lot of other teams around the league right now that probably don't have the same type of optimism mm. that is here if, with the Falcons because of some of the pieces of the puzzle that they have, where they sit with the salary cap, and what the future looks like. Um, speaking of the future, uh, most people that are listening to us know that we've been audio only the last few weeks. Let's go. But if you are also a fan, you saw an announcement that Ticketmaster Studios Ooh. have officially opened here at the Atlanta Falcons headquarters. And we were privy to get the tour last week. And um, I tell you what, if you are a fan of our podcast, if you are a fan of all the different productions coming out of Atlanta Falcons Digital Media, just wait. <laughs> it's about to it's, go times 10. Uh, as I don't even know if the young kids still say it, but it's about to get crumb. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, they have built some beautiful studios that we are going to look like, uh, like we are have arrived. Superstars, superstars. Yeah. So I cannot wait. Archer's already superstar, so we're just going to add to. Oh yeah, star yeah. We just got to get to his level, yeah, right? Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, but <laughs> wait uh, patiently for us the next time we come back. Live from the Ticketmaster Studios. Our steam Studios. producer, Sam, you got anything to say, Sam? We, we can, they can hear you. It's going to be cool, Sam go. says. There you go. Just want to make sure cool. everybody heard that. <laughs> so Ticketmaster Studios are open, so a lot of this off-season coverage that's about to come out from the organization is going to come out with a new flair that you are not going to believe. So kudos to Atlanta Falcons, Arthur Blank, and this entire organization for investing in all of different areas they do in this organization to keep it top-notch, and we're happy to be along for the ride. All right, we're getting ready to go into the postseason, um, and we're not a part of it, which sucks. sucks. I'll say that right now. <laughs> Big time um, sucks. But, okay, give me give me your two Super Bowl teams. Ooh. Chuck? Uh, I'm going Philly and Buffalo. Okay. Rack? That was my initial thought. So um, you're going to counter on that one? I'm gonna, well, I just, just to give it a little bit of flair, I'm going to say Philly and KC. Okay. Ooh. Okay, arch, here. arch. That's Flair, the two number one <laughs> seeds. Way to go out on a limb, right? Well, it's Flair. <laughs> it's Flair because I just want to see what Kansas City's going to do next on offense. <laughs> Snow globe. I mean, I mean, I can't even think of who else is in it on the NFC side. Can you? <laughs> I mean, Philly. Philly's been so dominant this year. Minnesota. Now Jalen, Jalen Hurts is back. Yeah, I, I don't Tampa, like that. Yeah. Niners. Um, Niners. Seahawks. That's what Seahawks. I'm going to do. I'm going to go my guy, Brock Purdy okay. from Iowa State. I'm going back Niners. To the Big Niners, <laughs> Cincinnati Bengals. Is this an emotional We're going to go back is to, what is that, 1982? Cincinnati in, in, <laughs> in San Francisco. So Burrow goes back to the Super Bowl. Burrow goes back. I think they are red hot. I think Cincinnati gets it done. They'll beat Baltimore this weekend in the coin toss game. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, I think they're red hot. I like them. Sam, they they were the got? one team that I didn't, I didn't think we handled them at all yeah. this season. Yep. And I don't think anybody else did very well either. Right. But uh, I got like, Cincinnati and the we, 49ers. We talk about dudes. Hey, they got some different dudes. They got a bunch of them on that team. Yeah, so. <laughs> All right. I don't know if you got a lot of right. color. So, Philly and KC. KC, one Philly, seeds. Buffalo. And you went Philly, Buffalo. And you got Niners and, and, and Purdy. Got, that sounds emotional yeah. there. Who's the Big 12 player? Is it really, is it really Purdy or is it the defense? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the latter. <laughs> All right, folks, we appreciate you joining us this season here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. We try to give you some X's and O's. We try to give you some opinions. But we also try to have a little bit of fun. So hopefully we did a good job doing that. And uh, hopefully we'll be invited back next year. I hope so. Uh, continue Especially to like, subscribe, and review. Be that better be in the beautiful conference room. I was getting that studio and fancy <laughs> lights and, and cameras. And so I can listen to you two fuss about each other's audio uh, moving yeah, forward. And, and don't wait for us till, till, till the, the season starts. I can guarantee you that we're going to do a lot more. We're going to come back to you guys. We got some we got some free agent talk. We might even get shocked to break the combine down for us. It's going to be a lot <laughs> of fun. Come on, let's go. We're going to do the draft. Yeah. We're going to be back for you here on Falcons Audible, so stay tuned for the next. <laughs> we're the next we're episode. actually going to allow Arch to do some of the combine drills, some five ten five in there. Yeah, I don't know that. that Arch would do some, well. some 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 QB drills. Yeah, just as long as I don't have to do the vertical. <laughs> <laughs> just make sure we get video because there'll be all kinds of yeah. tendons and muscles oh, flying all over. Rack, the place. if there was one combine activity that you could do right now, which one would you choose? Broad jump. Oh. Okay. Broad jump. Broad jump. You got to explode, though. Yeah, that was one of my it was my, one of my favorites. I did well at it, I mean, for my position and everything, and I could still jump a little bit. Okay. Just a little bit. Arch. Nice. 
No, they, they ain't one. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't one. <laughs> no. He said they ain't got one. Do they have they one for golf swing? Do they have golf swing? <laughs> DJ, what's yours? Uh, I, can I just be the ones that throw to the guys that run it, receivers down the middle? <laughs> you just want to be right the all-time quarterback. Yeah, all-time quarterback. <laughs> All right, so the Falcons Audible podcast has got uh, you at broad jump, all-time quarterback, <laughs> and then um, – Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> But Arch will hold that down, baby. Arch got that right. I got the water for Arch you. Arch is one of the best athletes I know, so I don't believe anything <laughs> he's saying right now. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. We'll be back very soon, and be sure to, to like, subscribe, review, and pay attention to all of the coverage coming out from the Atlanta Falcons. we got a whole lot more coming. Thanks for joining us, everybody.